All right. Well, I'm just starting my day here in San Diego, America's finest city, as Jurgen said. Um, we do have a lot of material that we'll be going through quickly. So if you have questions, and I'm sure you will have questions, grab the slide number, and then at the end, we'll be able to go back and view that and answer your questions in more detail. Uh, there's a lot of information because the idea is simple. Why can't you come up with regulatory submission ready conformity assessment test reports? Sounds like a great idea. How hard can that be? So we're gonna lay the foundation to show you that actually we have a clear pathway to doing that through IHE International Profiles and uh, IHE uh, Conformity Assessment with the support of IHE Catalyst. So with that, are you ready, Stefan? I am. Okay, let me get us going here. So Stefan is based in, uh, where are you anyway? Lubick right now? I'm in Lubick, Rattle. yes. That's the Boulder and, <laughs> and I'm in San Diego. Uh, we are both uh, have many, many years of uh, work in device informatics, device uh, standards. And uh, we're, we're actually being very engaged here today by the OR.net, which is a nonprofit organization with more than 50 international uh, uh, partners, but most importantly, it's the sponsor of the IHE Devices Device Point of Care Interoperability Program. And so uh, we're looking forward to bringing all of this uh, work to you. So here's what we're going to have on slate for today. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the medical device, MedTech Device Interoperability Challenge. Again, how hard can it be? Uh, and then we'll look at the new generation of medical device interoperability. MDI standards, along with profiles of those standards and this community that is uh, formed around the world to support advancing that. So we'll take a quick look at that. We'll look at the regulatory realities that the medtech industry faces and uh, how we have actually factored that in in a unique way at the very core of what we're advancing in these profiles and standards. And then some big ideas that it takes to really get us to where we can truly say, yes, we can come up with IHE conformity assessment test reports that are regulatory submission ready. So with that, let's take a look. MedTech Device Interoperability Challenge. Uh, we've been working on this for decades, okay? <laughs> so how hard can it be? And how do we know that we're not just going to keep working on it for more decades? And for others, it's not just that question, but it's also, what's the big deal? You've seen medical device interoperability. And uh, uh, we've seen devices interoperable in other industries. Why is medical med tech any different? Well, we've been promising this for 40 years. I've been around for a lot of that 40 years, and some of you have too. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? I'm not saying that we are crash test dummies in this endeavor, but sometimes it feels like that. Uh, and as we ponder the next 40 years, I won't be around for all of that. We ask the question, why do we think it'll be any different from the past? You've heard uh, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and again and again, thinking that the results will be different. So what is different now uh, that will result in us actually being able to realize that promise of true medical device interoperability. And does it have to be this hard? Well, it is med tech. It is life critical. When things go wrong, they can go very wrong, even life threatening. So yeah, it's hard and it needs to be hard. Is it a technology problem? Is it just we lack uh, the appropriate technology? Well, over the last 40 years, we've solved the technical problem a few times. Of course, technology changes, but uh, it's not a technology problem. We've proven that before again and again. So what is the real challenge? Number one is misaligned business drivers. I mean this, especially in the macroeconomic perspective, those who have to spend all the time and effort and resources to create uh, med tech products that are safe and effective and secure and interoperable versus those who pay for that and demand that versus those who benefit from it. Those business drivers have been misaligned again and again over the decades when we've solved this problem. Different ways, I won't go into that, but it's very frustrating. 
But number one problem is a business model issue. And then incomplete standards. Oftentimes we've solved part of the puzzle like reporting device data right, from a medical device to an EHR, EMR. But what about uh, medical grade alerting, distributed alerting, or what about external control? Without that, you only have a piece of the solution. So with that, let's look at some of the use cases and contexts that help you understand what exactly are we talking about when we talk about med tech interoperability. Stefan, why don't you lead us through these? Thank you very much, uh, Todd. And uh, maybe you can already complete the slide uh, for me um, because I would like to point you to a very good document, which is a compendium of medical device oriented use cases, um, which uh, has been compiled uh, by one of our co-chairs, uh, Ken Fuchs. It's really good to read if you want to know what we'd like to address uh, with uh, medical device interoperability. And if you go to the next slide, um, I did bring you some examples and uh, I saw already in the list of names, uh, some familiar names, so they probably know the examples. Um, but uh, here's one of the slides uh, we created for the OR.net that Todd mentioned at the beginning. And uh, the example here is that if you uh, are, for example, in the OR uh, and uh, have a laparoscopic uh, surgery, um, you might uh, need uh, as a surgeon or as a clinician working on the patient uh, to see the different settings of the surgical devices like the high frequency surgical device or the laparoscopic light source as an overlay um, in the image um, so that you don't have to switch the contexts and get distracted from the procedure. And if you go uh, to the next slide here, um, one of the solutions um, could be that you create an me uh, interoperable medical device system where the uh, laparoscopic camera system communicates with the devices uh, that are used by the surgeons and just exchange the data so they can be uh, rendered as an uh, overlay about the operating field. Of course, it shouldn't distract uh, the surgery, but uh, uh, that's something related more to usability. Um, one other from, a, from another area, uh, this example, uh, I think this is very popular right now, uh, especially during the pandemic situation, is isolation room remote control, so that you are maybe not uh, have to change dresses all the time uh, before you go into a patient's room, but maybe can control the settings of a ventilator from outside the room. And uh, I like this picture, I found it somewhere on LinkedIn, um, uh, where they had the genius idea just to have a long cable um, moving out uh, of the room. But of course, you could solve this also, uh, let's say, with an interoperable medical device system so that the staff doesn't have to go into the room and you limit staff exposure. So if you go to the uh, next slide, there also could be a solution that you have an interoperable system, let's say in this case, the device A, um, which communicates with uh, the other devices like the ventilators, infusion pumps, patient monitoring, or what you have on uh, the bedside, um, transmits alarms, displays them, visualizes the clinical data, but which also may allow uh, the control of settings. And of course, if you look at this as a pure software device, maybe this probably would be a software as a medical device uh, classified. And um, if you then go to the uh, next so slide. Before we move on, Stefan, let yeah, me just sure. say that this specific use case, isolation point of care, uh, use case is one that we've been focusing in on uh, the fire connected thons, right? We have three of those January, May, we have one in September, this use case. And in the last one in May, we, we actually thought about isolation room and you usually think about an isolation ICU bed, for example. Yeah. But now with hospital at home and the desire to keep isolation patients out of the hospital or at home, if possible, isolation room point of care at home is a reality. And so yeah. it's a lot of fun discussing those. And we uh, invite people to join us for the uh, September uh, Fire Connectathon and, and the uh, isolation point of care track. Yeah, and it's actually one of the use cases. Uh, so we did a recent study on interoperability and the value of interoperability. And I think the isolation room was currently the most or the highest ranking Fantastic. use case. You maybe saw one of the postings that we did on that. So. What are other interoperability applications? These are just two examples. 
Um, of course, you can classify data-driven clinical applications, like we saw real-time patient status, remote control, isolation room, but it could also be related to automatic documentation for forensic documentation purposes, reimbursement, of course, all the data analytics applications you can have in mind, and uh, it could be related to care automation, of course, in the end, maybe physiological closed-loop controller. Um, so there is a real need, and you can find a lot of these use cases in the compendium from uh, that Ken uh, compiled. Um, so there's a real need um, for these kind of applications, which would benefit from an interoperable solution. And uh, the one of the challenge here is, and I like to highlight it below, is it's a statement I think from a publication from uh, 2007. Interoperability is an almost non-existing feature of medical devices. It's maybe not true completely anymore, but I think uh, it still me uh, meets a lot of the devices. And especially if you think of it from the whole perspective um, of having third party devices in there and addressing all these kind of uh, use cases that for example, involve also remote control or distributed alarming. And uh, Todd, uh, maybe- so, And I will say this, uh, Stefan, yeah. The reason we highlighted that is because uh, there's a phrase that we often use from the device interface. So yeah. yes, we are getting more data out of devices uh, through gateways into enterprise applications. Um, but when you're talking about actual interoperability at the device, like you showed that long cable with the ventilator, yeah, yeah that really is virtually non-existent. There's some little yeah. pockets, but it's, it's generally not there. And um, so what, what, why is it so complex? And uh, why don't we have more solutions? I think one of the problems is related to the whole development complexity of such systems. Because if you want to bring out a device, let's say a patient monitor, uh, which should be part of, let's say maybe a, a guided care solution uh, in the ICU, um, how, how do you really develop such systems and bring them on the market, place them on the market um, so that they are safe, secure, and effective? Um, so here I would say over the last years, the complexity of where these uh, devices should participate in the use cases has increased uh, enormous. And um, this doesn't really match up with the normal development process that you would have here. And maybe we find a solution for the future and how to do this better. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, then we could, of course, discuss, well, maybe one of the uh, ideas on how to do that could be related to, to systems engineering as, a pro as an approach, maybe model-based systems engineering. And I think Todd will uh, talk to that uh, in a few seconds, where we really think about how do we do the concept development, um, where we define the cost at the beginnings, and in the end, maybe have a leaner or a faster time to market. And Maybe Todd, uh, you can take over from here on uh, for yeah. the next slides. And I will say that uh, when you look at um, this last slide and you look at the autonomous care, right? Yeah. Or systems of products that plug and, tr and play, or plug and trust as we'll say in a few minutes, this is where MedTech has to go, is going. The complexity that's kept us 40 years trying to get MDI going, is only going to get more challenging. And this slide shows that. The yeah. cost is often what is left out of the standards uh, focus or the even the uh, profiling focus, what it costs adopters to actually do this. We have to address that directly in the kinds of um, uh, computable artifacts that we uh, provide in order to ensure that the whole product life cycle is uh, uh, impacted. And though, this cost line is all about quality, right, Stefan? Uh, another part of that is, well, what happens if you don't have quality in a med tech world? And that is legal liability. And so it's a very, it's a huge reality years after product is in the market, including software as a medical device, medical apps, um, and then the regulatory costs uh, all add into this. So yes, this is huge. So. MedTech interoperability challenges, open questions that we're not going to address today are many. Okay, and you see those here. MedTech product life cycles are really long as opposed to IT product, even health IT product life cycles. What is a medical device? It's changing all the time. And medical apps is no longer an idea, it's a reality. Um, uh, software or uh, uh, diagnostic uh, 
what is it, uh, diagnostic uh, or digital therapeutic apps, DTX, digital therapeutic apps is a reality, okay? Uh, regulated device ecosystem, how does that work when you're using technologies that are not typically uh, used in this regulated life critical uh, situation? How do you risk manage component products in a system of products in a decoupled ecosystem? Decoupled means they're heterogeneous. They're, de they're developed by different companies and they may not uh, be coordinated in advance. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And standards that come from all sorts of different standards, organizations and med tech tool chain for the entire product uh, development life cycle management. How are you going to be able to support that? So. 40 year wander, yeah, because it is hard, but we have to do differently and do better uh, as we go forward. I think we're actually achieving that in what we're showing you today. And we're enabling significant implementer value chain improvements, not just focused on a paper-based standard, but we're showing you some very, very great improvements. So let's talk about that. What is new? What is different? Why can we say there is actual reason why we should be so confident and hopeful for a brighter future than the last 40 years. This gives you a general overview of the medical device interoperability landscape, okay? And on the right, uh, you have uh, more of the enterprise integration, okay? And here you have uh, imaging systems, packs, and electronic medical record, different services and labs. And honestly, you use uh, DICOM HL7 version two. Uh, so as uh, we just heard before this, uh, some of that uh, uh, testing is going on, HL7 fire for the enterprise integration parts of this. But then on the left, you have the medical device interoperability from the device interface network. And they're com complementing standards. They're not in competition with each other. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but they are different worlds with different design requirements, different criticalities, different regulatory realities uh, that must be addressed for products to be successfully developed, uh, deployed and used. Um, so what is in the middle? It's a gateway. So really what we're talking about today is moving away from gateway centric architecture where it's all proprietary on the left. And then you have a vendor gateway and then you have enterprise and there's no way of integrating those other than some sort of proprietary way on the left. That is what is very different and doing it in a way that uses the standards in a very complementary way. So today you've heard, uh, you're hearing about the ISO IEEE 11073 service-oriented device connectivity from the device interface standards, the blue on the left. And this gives you an idea of the different capabilities that are provided um, uh, from uh, control and automation, alarm distribution, medical uh, uh, distributed alarms, visualization, um, and data analytics, even though uh, so most of those analytics might be done uh, with a fire, SDC fire gateway, as you saw in the previous slide, uh, we are enabling that. Uh, and so uh, this is a, a set of uh, standards, ISO, International, CEN also. So ISO, CEN, IEEE 11073, SDC standards. Don't be confused. Uh, in our health world, health IT world, SDC often means structured data capture. So when I say 11073 SDC, I mean something different, okay? Um, and again, ORNet has been a champion of those standards uh, from the last 15 years. This is kind of the key part of this. This is a, a slide, I won't go into the stack, but it's service-oriented device connectivity. And it really is looking at uh, device to device uh, 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 dynamic uh, service-oriented architecture um, uh, for a plug and play network, plug and trust network. Um, so that is what we're talking about, dynamic discovery and exchange. Uh, there's a lot of, of detail here we won't go into, but there are standards. We love standards. We love standards models. And this is the SDC standards cathedral model. That'll be a theme you'll hear about. It's a cathedral and it's built upon the core uh, connectivity standards. Uh, there are real products on real patients in active use using the core SDC standards today, different places in the world. So this is not wishing, this is a reality. 
and we're moving it forward to even broaden that more. There's key interoperability purposes. What do you mean by that? Uh, it turns out that when you think about device interoperability and you talk about, well, what are the intended uses or the purposes for having that interoperable interface? It boils down to three. One is plug and trust or connectivity, just general connectivity in a safe, effective and secure way. And then metrics or reporting, uh, alerting, device alerts, as well as external control. So the four key interoperability purposes. We have specializations. You can see these are really focused on uh, uh, endoscopic surgery. And then we have the nomenclature on the left. Uh, this is really important because the nomenclature in the semantic model on the left gives us semantic interoperability across the space. Very quickly, here are the profiles uh, that we are then doing. Those are the, I just showed you the ISO SEN IEEE 11073 SDC standards. We are profiling that in IHE devices. We have four profiles for SD PI, service oriented device point of care interoperability. Uh, and those are the four that were about to uh, publish as version 1.0. Again, they map, as you can see in the purple here, to the four key interoperability purposes. Uh, and they leverage those core standards. They also have gateway interfaces. So IHE gateway actors uh, for the HL7 Fire Point of Care Device Implementation Guide. So how I can use the same type of uh, profile or implementation guide that is being used in the IHE European Connectathon this week for the POU profile for a fire-based personal health device uh, uh, exchange, we can use that for point of care devices as well. Separate implementation guide, but they're harmonized. For alerting, we're working on that in fire, but we also have HL7 version two messaging and IHE profiles, device to enterprise communication deck and alert communication management that we will integrate with ESDC world through these gateway actors. And then finally, integrating for the medical purposes, um, these participant key purposes standards, those four that we just talked about. So it's well integrated and that's what we're working on right now. What about community? I said it's a new community. We have actually doing most of this work in a joint IHE HL7 Gemini project focused on device interoperability. Um, this is a huge community. Uh, if you go to HL, confluence.hl7.org, you see the, the uh, label there uh, and look for device interoperability. Um, you'll, you'll pop up to a world of uh, Confluence pages that give you all sorts of information. But this has been a very effective, productive partnership between IHE and HL7, working on uh, making sure the best of both standards and the tooling are leveraged. Notice all the standards groups here working together. So that is what is new. That is what is different. That is what has put us at a place to where we can do uh, far more than we have been able to previously if we address some key issues like medtech regulatory realities. So Stefan, back to you. Why don't you tell us about these realities? Yes, uh, I, I would uh, happily do that. And uh, I saw also in the list of participants, uh, some of my former colleagues uh, from Draga uh, who worked actually with me on these topics as well as all the OANET guys. So this is from a slide deck that we use to discuss it with the authorities. How could we do differently in actually putting products on the market um, for such an interoperable system? And so say that uh, again, would... who we are discussing with the authority. So this is not yes. this is actual engagement of those in the regulatory affairs or, yes, or regulators. Is. Yeah, so it's, a, it's a, a very good discussion, very fruitful discussion. And I think they did understand a lot of what we try to achieve and uh, it's very good. So it's um, how we would have done it before. It would be more or less all based on combinations. Maybe we can uh, slip that, uh, skip that slide um, and go to the next one. Um, but for example, to enable uh, in such an interoperable system, in such a dynamic system, um, the how could you say if something works together in a, in a safe, secure and effective way? So for example, one thing that we needed to introduce into the uh, STC standard is the concept of safety classification, where the manufacturer of a device can classify how the data is intended to be used for example, for medical purposes, or maybe only for documentation purposes, if they cannot assure 
that it can be used in certain clinical applications. So that's, for example, part of it, um, which is only driven that we want in the end something like plug and trust, as you mentioned already, uh, that we can put uh, devices together, medical or interoperable medical device systems, and they can dynamically exchange their capabilities and for what purpose the data can be used. And uh, maybe you uh, can go to the, to the next slide for me. Um, one of the big ideas behind it is, uh, and it's actually laid out in, in a document from the ORNet uh, consortium, um, is the so-called conformance principles. And I think we will discuss it a little bit later on how uh, uh, conformance testing or will help here. And it's all related uh, to the idea of having system functions, so clinical functions uh, that somehow support uh, the patient care and to split up responsibilities as well uh, from a process perspective, um, as well as from the technical perspective into system function contributions. So for example, if you do have a system function, let's say, um, indicating the current patient status, um, for example, um, then you could split it up into two parts. One that is the service consumer that's presenting the data, and maybe one that is the, the service provider, in this case, maybe the ventilator that is actually providing the data. And they do have different responsibilities from a risk management perspective, from a usability perspective, but of course also for example, from a labeling perspective regarding the IFUs. That's one of the big uh, ideas behind it. And if you uh, switch from me to the next slide, that could maybe end up that uh, the ventilator has something like provide a function uh, to change ventilation settings, whereas the uh, device A in this case provides a user interface for users to change the ventilation settings. And if this is done again, then there is, is the adjustment of the ventilation based on the request. And this is what uh, we try uh, to phrase here is it's decouple plug and trust. And maybe Todd, you can say something why we call it uh, this way. Yeah, and I'll talk about the trust gap in a few slides later, but the whole idea is that this ventilator does not necessarily know about this uh, SAMD medical app in yeah. advance, they were decoupled, they were developed in a different way, but they have both gone through the same um, regulatory pathway uh, that we'll talk about here. And as a result, they were developed and put on the market in a decoupled way. But when you put them on the net, they're able using the SDC and SDPI to be able to discover each other, to be able to see what those capabilities are and safe, safety classifications dynamically at the root of establishing security. Uh, and then be able to understand that and organize themselves. So not only are they developed and uh, advanced in a decoupled way, but the trust capability is baked in at the very beginning of exchange and allows them to, if you will, in a resilient, robust way, self-detect and organize and configure uh, such that they can uh, establish that trust and do exactly what you're seeing here. All right. So um, yeah, maybe we can uh, skip this slide. Uh, it's about the relationship to each other. How does an abstract system architecture look like for such an SDC system? And maybe directly move uh, more to the, uh, to the next slide. Because in order to put uh, in the end uh, the devices on the market, uh, of course, we do have a typical V model for that, um, where you have on the one side, of course, all the needs, requirements, and so forth. And of course, also these, you need to split, separate regarding, um, let's say, uh, yeah, the responsibility uh, for the contribution of, of a certain system function. But on the other side, of course, we do have all the verification, valid validation and integration effort, and this needs to be handled as well. Um, so in the end, we can provide objective evidence. Of course, if we just move up the V here, um, we need to have the, the normal standalone product VNB uh, aspects. But of course, then we would have also something like an interface verification, maybe automated. Um, and we need something uh, where we do a verification and validation, maybe in a reference system with representative uh, communication partners. And in the end, to make sure that it actually works in the, in the environment of the hospital, uh, of the responsible organization, 
there needs to be some part where the hospital take or the responsible organization takes care of validating that it actually works in this environment. This in the end will give objective evidence that this is safe, secure and effective. And maybe uh, Todd, uh, you can switch from- Well, let me make one observation. If yeah, I'm sure. a company that has multiple products around a product of care, and I want the products to work together, to interoperate in a safe, effective and secure way, I have to do this, but albeit in a proprietary way within my own companies or specific business partners. What is unique here is that it's open and it's the basis for being able to do that uh, decoupled plug and trust. That is a huge, big idea, as you said. Yeah. And um, the next slides basically just go into the details on how this could work from a split up of responsibilities and how you might combine this with a systems engineering approach. Um, looking at the point of time and that we want to have some discussions, I would pro propose that we skip over them um, and maybe just go to the next one because there's, uh, I think, a, a very interesting statement on this. Um, I don't know if you have uh, read already the FDA guideline on interoperable systems, um, where they also talk about, about reference systems and about communication interface verification. That's exactly the same idea um, that we follow with these conformance principles uh, that are used for STC. And um, this is also why the discussions uh, with the colleagues um, from the authorities, for example, uh, goes in a very good direction because they have the same ideas um, and this is just one solution on how to uh, actually provide evidence to them um, so that it fits into this guidance uh, document. Um, just as a reminder, and uh, there's a question below on this slide, does this FDA guideline also be a, is this applicable for the CE market? And I think from the discussion, I can summarize it. Well, it's state of the art, it's published. And uh, of course, it's, it's a good direction uh, to go um, so it's not directly applicable, but it's a good guidance also for the CMA. Todd. All right. Uh, I'll just reiterate uh, again, the four key purposes. And so, um, and that's baked into not only the SDC, I, 11073 SDC standards, but also our profiles. And that is a key element by integrating those this medical interoperability purpose into the profiles, it enables IHE conformity assessment then to ensure that the decoupled system has implemented the required quality regulatory risk control measures. Boy, there's a lot of detail here um, and we're only touching the surface, but hopefully you're getting the idea that there is, we're not insane, there is a reason for the confidence we have. Uh, one of the other areas that we've had a lot of people uh, ask about the transition from the medical device directives to the medical device regulations and uh, those changes that happened. And as you see on the right, uh, I have the EUMDR.com uh, uh, page from uh, uh, just recently, and you can see that there are updates coming on all the time. You can go to that web URL to see it. Um, I, I have some bullets of what is different. You know, the really key difference here is that you have to have evidence both before and during of, of how you've um, been, how these systems are interoperating. How do you get that evidence? You have to have interoperability. So uh, what we are talking about here is directly supportive of the demands that we have now in the uh, updated MDRs. Uh, Stefan, is there anything else you'd like to say to this? No, I think that's a, that's a very good summary and uh, creating evidence maybe uh, with conformance uh, reports, tests, um, might be a very good solution. Yep. Okay, so with that, we've talked about uh, the standards and uh, or the problems and the challenges with med tech interoperability. We've talked about the standards and the profiles and the community that's supporting it. We've talked about the regulatory uh, challenges that have to be met to be able to get product to the market. Okay, what about regulatory submission ready uh, based on IHE conformity assessment? Can we do that? Well, yes, but it's gonna take some big ideas, some innovative ideas. Here's one, uh, SES plus MDI, safe, effective and secure plus medical device interoperability, a parallel universe problem. The problem is very simple. Those who work on more of the techie side of device interoperability develop techie standards and develop techie solutions. Those who are responsible for quality, for regulatory affairs, for legal liability 
have their own set of standards and their own um, uh, uh, communities that are developing those. And the bottom line is they aren't developed and uh, integrated in a cohesive way. Every company that wants to develop a med tech problem or product has to take MDI standards for interoperability and SES standards. Why is that? Because at the end of the day, why can't we provide a way in which these are seamlessly interconnected um, and then helping out those who are the product developers? Can we create a framework to create and enable trusted, you now know what that means, interoperable product decoupling? using MDI standards, like the ones we've talked about, SDC, SDPI, and FIRE, as well as SES standards, like those from the Joint Working Group 7 uh, between ISO TC215, Health Informatics, and IEC TC62. And uh, those are the safety, effectiveness, and security standards. So let's consider the SES temple diagram. We had a, a cathedral model uh, for the IEEE 11, uh, uh, 11073 standards. Here's a temple diagram. Notice uh, you have a left and a right, a blue for those who develop technology. And on the right, you have uh, those who are implementing it and using it. On the bottom, you have areas that must be managed across this life cycle. We have it from component design all the way to uh, implementation, to deployment, to use, to decommissioning. This is the SES model um, that they've created. And it uses standards, as I said, from these two uh, international organizations, as well as others. Uh, the key capabilities, the subject areas are standardized in this 81001-1, which will be published uh, this year. Actually, I think it's, it's very close to publication now. And then others that you've heard about, like 82304-1, uh, health software products. We actually have dash two for uh, uh, apps. Health apps, health software apps, 80,001 1. So you heard Stefan talk about uh, a medical IT network or responsible parties. Um, or, those are all concepts that are in the 80,001 1. So we have specific products or specific problems for in the SES space standards and a model for how we look at that. Well, what about the MDI and what about bringing these two together? Well, we have a hanging gardens model. So we had a cathedral, then a temple, now we have hanging gardens. And this is a work of art. It's something that only a standard guy can use, but it's how we actually put together different standards from different organizations with different foci and are able to put those together and say, where do the pieces fit, okay? And how do these all come together in the end into a single interface that is SES, MDI, plug and trust, okay? Different standards, different organizations, but at the end of the day, one interface. So there's this trust gap. If you take this model, and as I said, there's a gap left to right. You develop it, you get it cleared for market, you put it there, but then you have products, systems of products decoupled that have to be able to interoperate. How does that work? How do you actually address that trust gap? Well, what if you took this model and then you took the SES MDI framework, Hanging Gardens model, and you integrated those? That is what vendors who are developed products have to do. What if we did that as part of what we're doing in this Gemini project? That's exactly what we're doing, SES plus MDI. It's a big idea. We haven't done it before. And we're actually developing a technical report in Joint Working Group 7 that's going to look at that. Another big idea is steps that need to be taken, pragmatic steps. And I, I uh, capture those as three areas, requirements interoperability. For that whole model, how do you establish traceability from the one interface up to the many different standards that are, uh, it supports? How do you make sure you have test coverage to cover all the requirements from all these different standards and conformity that you can guarantee that a given uh, interface uh, supports that? Hang on a second. The second one is model centric. How do you establish a computable model-based single source of truth specification that supports all stakeholders' needs? And then lastly, regulatory ready. That's what we're all about today here. IHE conformity assessment that provides 
regulatory submission ready test reports. So let's go back to our hanging gardens model and think about requirements interoperability. Okay, so we have different standards from different organizations, all of which pull together into a single interface, one layer, one standard at a time. So as you're implementing these products, you have to think about each one of these, how you're going to actually leverage the requirements from those, but you have to do it individually. And then a specification for a single interface. It's a lot of work, but it's what has to be done today. That's the challenge. What about the hope requirements interoperability? What if we could chart a happy path, okay, in the standards that goes from uh, the, the use case narratives, those requirements down through architectures, specializations, uh, key interoperability purposes, uh, uh, IHE uh, gateways or, or uh, profiles, down through the IEEE standards, down to the actual plug and tray, play, plug and trust interface charting a pathway there. Maybe we have a pathway that only goes to the profile, but then it goes straight to the devices on fire specifications. Maybe we have a combination where actually the use case has some that is in that plug and trust model, but other parts of it have to be handled in, uh, for, at the enterprise level. And you have a gateway in between. How hard can that be? Well, believe it or not, it can be really hard. In the absence of having a consistent tooled way of doing that, you're having to chart that kind of integration on a per standard basis, ad hoc requirements integration. We need requirements interoperability baked in. So that's one of the big ideas that we're working on in this. The next question is med tech developers, how are they managing the complexity and cost of next generation uh, solutions? Simply said, Model-based systems engineering is a methodology using SysML, uh, a, a modeling systems modeling language based on a UML profile and automation tooling. Can standards specifications move from being document-centric to model-centric to support these complex next-generation technologies? And of course, the answer is, well, yeah, that's why we're here. MBSE, SysML, and tooling has advanced to make this 100% viable. We've tried this in the past, but the UML models have become more of just another document. We can actually tool this as a single source of truth. And I would say without transitioning from document-centric to a computable model-centric single source of truth specification, our standards adoption, especially for MedTech MDI, will be abysmal for the next 40 years. Stefan, why don't you kind of lead us through, you're the expert here of MBSE. Thank you very much, Short. Uh, so model-based systems engineering is uh, basically like a formalized application of modeling, which we have done also for years now, um, to support system requirements, system architectures, of course, design analysis, verification and validation activities. And it begins at the very beginning conceptual design phase and goes through the whole uh, development and later life cycle phases. So it's uh, from the birth to the end um, and it supports everything with modeling or application of modeling. And if you go to uh, the next so kind slide, of like that, that temple diagram with the life cycle. Yeah, it has that same it's stamp, exactly, but it's it has all the life engineering phases. process to that. Yeah. That's Which, by the way, I've heard from some regulators talking about, you know, 81001-1, where that life cycle temple diagram is, is great, but we need to add more systems engineering to it. So this is perfect from a regulatory standpoint. Yeah, and I think one of the main uh, benefits will really be uh, when you transition from a document-based uh, approach where you have a lot of references, cross-references, keep all consistent, I think that's what uh, Todd just mentioned. If you go more to uh, a system model approach where you have one single source of truth, um, th this makes it of course easier to handle it and get a consistent set of requirements that you need to implement. Um, and if you go maybe to, to the next slide. Um, one thing, I'll, I'll just say an anecdote. Yeah, sure. I've heard some say, um, you know, what do we do with a profile or a standard? Well, we get it. The first thing we do is search for all the shell statements in the document. And then we 
And, and then they, and then we say, okay, how do we do this? And then when you try to interoperate it, it connect it on, it's like, well, no, this is how we interpreted it. How do you interpret it that? And then when something changes, how do you keep it all together? So it only makes sense, especially with complexity, to go to a model-based approach. Yeah, and uh, maybe due to the time, we skip this slide and uh, go directly to to uh, to the next ones. Uh, which is a typical approach for model-based system engineering called RFAP, requirements, functional, logical, and physical architecture. Um, I think we will not go into all the details, but one of the key aspects here is definitely, of course, we need requirements for the development and design of our products, later checking, of course, uh, if we can integrate them. And here, requirements interoperability might help, as Todd uh, just mentioned. Um, so, Going to, to the next slide, um, I think Todd, uh, it's up to you again. Are we so ready? We regulatory ready. So based on all that we've talked about, do we think we're there yet? Do we think we can actually take IHE conformity assessment test reports and include those in regulatory submissions for a given product, like in a 510K submission to the FDA? Answer is, well, we have a comprehensive integrated SCS MDI regulatory pathway, okay? So it's, it's built in from the foundation up. Uh, the SDPI plus fire profiles pull all that together and that's what we're actually testing when we do conformity assessment in IHE. Requirements interoperability provides the traceability and coverage required to con claim conformity to these key SCS standards as well as the MDI risk mitigations. Uh, and then MBSC and SysML not only increases the overall quality across all implementers, but enables uh, technologies like simulation with a computable specification. Uh, so you can actually do validation of systems of products at that abstract level. So yes, but what is the basis for confidence that a regulatory agency would actually recognize and accept these test reports as sufficient evidence of SES MDI? Well, the FDA, as you may be aware, has a standards and conformity assessment program. And as you see with the red arrow, their whole idea is to have a collaborative approach with standards development organizations and applications of those. So they're very much down the path for that. And they actually have an accreditation scheme for conformity assessment, ASCA, which when you look at this, you realize that it uses the same NIST expertise. Actually, there are NIST experts uh, embedded in the FDA ASCA program, and they use the same ISO 17000 conformity assessment uh, approach as we do in IHE. So the stars are aligned. The pedigree is about the same to be able to do this. There's a lot more detail here. I have some URLs you'll be able to look at later, but this really gives us a high level of confidence. So again, are we there yet? Are we there yet? No, but we are closer than ever before. And for some of us who have been there for a long time, we recognize that. And we're closing fast on this long sought after goal of plug and trust, safe, effective, and secure medical device interoperability. Conclusions, 11073 STC standards provide true plug and trust, trust interoperability. That Gemini project joint between IHA and HL7 using STC, SDPI plus FHIR will deliver the products profiles that are needed for interoperable med tech product implementation and deployment. SCS MDI closes that interoperability trust gap on the base on the on the part of all stakeholders. Uh, the requirements interoperability model centric transition and regulatory ready provide new value for all implementers. Remember, it's not enough just to get a document and then figure out what to do in SCS and in, in isolation. You need to be able to take these three areas to really achieve true value improvement. Regulatory pathway, engagement with regulatory bodies uh, and pilot project like the FDA ASCA, set the stage for decoupled products. And looking at the total product life cycle through an, an in, in enablement of automation tool chains for that. These are all key areas that IHG conformity assessment, working with the support from IHG Catalyst will support putting all these puzzle pieces together. Tomorrow, we haven't gotten into a lot of detail on IHE Catalyst or the IHE testing continuum. That's because tomorrow, there are two sessions that are focused on that. Um, those two sessions, uh, it's 
this is the URL. I think I have the URL on there. Um, it, you, you have it from registering for this one. It's not too late. Register for it, show up, and you'll get some excellent uh, background uh, on in depth on these two areas as well. So with that, thank you for your patience hanging in there. It's been a lot in a short period of time. And now uh, Stefan and I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Yeah, no, I already saw one in, in the chat. Um, so maybe I can read it out. Um, so it's uh, Ted and, uh, Todd and Stefan. Are you aware on the remote control safety standard in development by Amy? It is based on the Amy emergency use guidance for remote ventilator control. Maybe Todd, uh, do you want, want to answer yeah. that? So there's a, a AMI did a consensus report, a, a CR last year, uh, specifically on that. Absolutely, we've looked at that. Uh, we've engaged with Amy, that committee that's working on that. Uh, actually, uh, one of the principals for that, uh, Dr. Stephen Dane, uh, uh, is also an IEEE 11073 uh, uh, officer and is very involved in our work uh, that we're doing here. So we are very much part of that. But there's a difference when you're talking about from the device interface or medical device interoperability technology versus what are the higher level clinical functions that you need to take on? So uh, whereas the CR for that you're talking about is very uh, more general, more high level from a clinical perspective, we think that they are actually fairly um, cohesive or, or supportive or, you know. Complementary. Complementary, there's the good, that's the right word. Uh, yeah. So answer is absolutely yes. And uh, we have, we're connecting the dots between the groups and hopefully be able to ensure that going forward. So and I think uh, in the meanwhile, you probably saw that you can unmute uh, for asking questions. Yes, sir. Yes, no, uh, you are doing all the work for me. So <laughs> <laughs> now for the audience, um, please go ahead and mute yourself um, for any questions you would like to ask uh, Tots or Stefan. Don't be bashful. seems to be a, a lot of content that needs to be digested, probably. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so maybe, uh, maybe Todd, I, I, I have actually one question for you. Um, so oh, no. how is actually the interaction with uh, the whole conformity assessment program uh, from IG? We touched it at the end a little bit, um, but maybe you can say some more words to it. Uh, what is the ideas behind it? Are there already like connector tones going yep, on? Absolutely. So again, if you go back to that, uh, uh, confluence.hl7.org uh, page, and you look for the Gemini device interoperability, you'll get a whole set of uh, Confluence pages, including a set of pages on conformity assessment, as well as community events. We have IHE plugathons uh, that uh, currently are based uh, in Germany, but they're all virtual because the first one was last October, where every about every two months uh, we get together and we actually connect different devices and work on different areas. Uh, and so right now what they're actively doing, they just had their third one, uh, June 1st and 2nd, I believe. The next one is in August. And they're working on test sequences, test scripts to be able to try out the different uh, transactions and messaging sequences uh, between vendors that would then ultimately participate in a connectathon. We're hoping to have a virtual SDPI um, uh, IHE connectathon of a published um, uh, profile later this year, at the end of this year, based on this plugathon work. Uh, and then next year, our hope is to be able to actually uh, test this uh, formally at a North America and a European Connectathon in 2022. And maybe even a stretch goal is to be able to uh, participate in some public demonstrations um, of that tested uh, technology, um, uh, especially in 2022. Uh, we have a lot of other events going on and demonstrations. And as I said, the OR.net, working with others um, uh, like you, Stefan, and others uh, like uh, uh, Armin uh, Johns, um, have done demonstrator projects for the last 10 plus years. Uh, so there's been a lot that's gone on there. But we're laying the stage for being able to actually have uh, a standard IHE conformity assessment uh, process leading to uh, being able to do a uh, uh, formal product level conformity assessment and test reports that you would be able to submit 
with regulatory authority. Sounds great. Are there any more questions from the audience? Oh, maybe from my side here, Jens Bartok from Trigger. And Todd, what do you expect? When do we will have that? Because we would love to have that. And the first stage, you know, we need these PKP standards finalized and published. This is the most important thing for us right now. Yeah, so maybe uh, Jens, uh, happy to answer that question. Uh, I, I maybe take the second part. So I know that the balloting uh, is finally approved to start for the first PKP standard. Um, so I think it will probably start maybe this week or next week. And uh, then when we are rolling, then all the standards typically uh, get through the pipeline uh, pretty fast. Maybe Todd, maybe you can say something to the IHE uh, SDPI uh, profile. Yeah, the goal is to be able to have it uh, available uh, 1.0 sometime in the third quarter of this year. Uh, so in the next three to four months, if you look at the current draft supplement, document, not model. Um, it's over 200 pages. So it basically lays out the big picture of all the capability. But what we're doing is subsetting that and saying, what do we have to have in version 1.0 uh, to be able to do at least a minimally viable product, the MVP. So we're actively doing that. Actually, we should have that subset identified uh, in the next before the end of this month, June. And then we'll push forward on finishing that uh, supplement and moving it through the IHE public comment and trial implementation phases in the coming months. Uh, but there are many areas like the PKP standards that won't be there uh, by the time we need to get that first one out. So it's mm -hmm. very clear that we have a pathway for integrating all of this uh, that will be iterated. So we're trying to establish a first publication while in parallel we're bringing up other areas um, and then be able to integrate those in subsequent versions later this year and especially in 22 and 23. So maybe uh, just as a closing remark, maybe it's, it's one comment in the chat I just saw, um, which says, it's a great challenge. We don't know how long it will take to achieve this goal. Um, and thank you for the interesting session. Uh, but I think that's a very good summary. It is a great challenge. And I think Todd, you mentioned it uh, in between uh, also. But uh, I think you, that has a long history with all these topics, and I as well, I think we are on the right path. We are not there yet completely, but uh, I think we are closing in on the finishing. Well, we're line. not crash test dummies. No, <laughs> hopefully not. <laughs> so I see uh, applause. <laughs> yes. Thank you so very much. So with that, I think um, we should close uh, the session. And um, yeah, I thank you very much for this very uh, informational and uh, insp inspirational session. Um, it gives a lot of hope, I would say. So thanks again, uh, Stefan and Todd, for your time and share all your insights and the developments that are uh, going on. Very exciting. Uh, thank you also for everybody who was in the session and listened. And um, yeah, I hope that you will um, that we will see you soon uh, in one of the other sessions, maybe tomorrow or at the social event. And um, mm -hmm. thanks again. And have a nice day. Thank, Thank you very much. much.